Well, Mike, maybe you could explain to us your relationship to uh, what we're about to see. Okay. My name is Mike Kassar. And I worked for HP for over 24 years in various parts of the world, let's put it this way. I started in HP here in Cupertino, where Apple spaceship is right now. <laughs> and I got my MBA going to University of Santa Clara in 1975, and I was interested in working for HP in the Middle East in 75. And my boss was surprised. I said, we did this when we did our performance evaluation. We did it every year, and this is what I want to do. When I get my MBA, this is what I want to do. And so he said, uh, well, uh, let me send a message to the HP office in the Middle East, which was based in Athens at the time. Hmm. So we're not ready to do this, and uh, uh, it might take uh, you know, a couple of years before we can do this. So I, went, uh, I left HP in 72, at the end of 75. I started in 72, and I went to work for a company that was supposedly based in Beirut, mm -hmm. Lebanon, mm -hmm. but there was a civil war going on, so the guy that hired me, the manager, the director, a partner, he said, well, things are not stable in Beirut, so we're going to move you to I'm man Jordan. Well, that's where I am from, uh -huh. originally. <laughs> I said, you know, do you mind? I said, no, I don't mind. So we left, I left HP, I resigned from HP. I had three and a half years of experience with HP. And we went there for eight months. Situation was miserable because many of the people in Lebanon used to leave Lebanon because of the civil war, and they would come to Jordan or Greece or Cyprus, but Jordan was their last resort. It's, you know, you can't have it in a car. And so there was no housing. We stayed in a hotel for three months <laughs> looking for a place to live. They told me it would cost $3,000 a year. We discovered that it would cost at least $10,000 a year, and they were not going to pay any of this. <laughs> so, anyway. Was that idea to, to uh, this is in the mid-70s, was this for to mini comp computers or? Yeah, mini computers, to, to computerize the accounting system. This was an accounting firm. Okay. It was a CPA firm affiliated with Haskins and Sears which was one of the big eight at that time. Okay. So I went as an employee of Haskins and Sears, not knowing that when I get there, I'm a local employee. Anyway, so, so I left in 75, we stayed eight months, and we came back to the US. <laughs> Didn't work out. I traveled during that time, visiting customers of this company, uh, accounting clients, and my job was to convert their accounting systems to use mini computers. Okay. HP, NCR, IBM didn't have any mini computers then. PTP, but NCR had had the local uh, office in Amman, Jordan, and so I used NCR as the company that will. We bid on for these companies in Yemen, in Oman, in uh, many of the uh, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, at that time, I did not go to Saudi Arabia, hmm. but the clients were in these Gulf countries, 
and uh, may I ask you, had uh, they had they been using mainframe computers previously or was this uh, and forgive my ignorance about none. it okay this was the beginning of computerization for yeah, them yeah. okay thank you uh, I'll go back to my early history in, in a minute or so but this is the they want their companies to buy computers through them. Right. Company, uh, computers that were available in the Middle East market, with, especially with support, support engineers that can fix them when they break or make them work. And, and my task was to computerize their accounting systems to use these computers that they will, will buy uh, from NCR, from HP, from IBM. Right. IBM had the uh, 360 in those days, and they had UNIVAC, uh, control data from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> that was my task. After eight months, things did not work out, and I decided to leave, come back to the U.S. So I came back to the Bay Area. Actually, we came back to San Diego. And I wanted to stay in San Diego because of family connections there. So I looked for a job in San Diego, and I didn't find one. I don't know how much of this you want to document. Please, well, as but, much as you'd like to tell. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I interviewed with CSC, Computer Science Corporation, in San Diego. And they told me we'd like to go to the Naval Ocean Systems Center, it was called NASC at the time. They were a customer of Computer Sciences. And we want you to, to uh, have an interview with the, uh, our client. So I dressed up in a three-piece suit. I go to the naval base, walk in this guy's office. His desk is full of papers, listings. He was in his sandals, and he, was, he had his feet on his desk. I'm not used to this. <laughs> I thought this is, you know, the Navy, you know? Yeah. What do you expect? So I answered his questions. I can do the job. I knew that for sure. It was a systems programmer to do system generation on HP computers and on the UNIVAC. And, and the HP computers at the time had paper tape. Just to know the system right. using paper tape. Yeah. So they called me. They said, no, we don't want you. Three months later, they called me, somebody from Commerce Corporation, they said, well, we have this job at the Naval Ocean System Center, and we'd like you to go for an interview. I said, I already did that. And he said, no. He said, oh, you're the guy with the suit. Don't come with the suit. <laughs> so I go, and it was the new guy, and uh, they offered me a job, and I stayed in San Diego <laughs> for three years. And I saw an ad in Computer World, which I used to get at the office, for a job to work for HP in Oregon. So I applied for it. I spoke with the hiring manager there, the R&D manager, and he said we'd like to come for an interview. It was when the Eclipse hit Oregon in 1979. <laughs> So I go with my family for this interview, and they hired me. No questions about it. I was supposed to do a database management system on the HP 85. I don't know if you saw it here. The HP 85 was HP's first instrument, but it was a PC, a basic interpreter PC. Right. And. Uh, was this your first exposure to uh, what we might call a microcomputer, a, yeah. a, a small system? Yeah. 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 
So I, they, they had the source code written in Colorado. So I went to visit Colorado. They gave me the source code. We we're going to do it in basic. Mm -hmm. It was based on the HP image system database. Master file, detail files, you know. I knew all of it. Because before I left to go to uh, the Middle East in 1975, I was a project manager to design a new database management system for the HP 300, okay. the Amigo. Okay. And so I did not want to use the image because I thought the system that I worked with at Stanford, which I had designed and built and implement, I wanted to port it and put it on the HP 300. To make a long story short, I, my boss came to me one day and he said, are you sure you want to work with this database management system? I have another project I would like to work on. I said, tell me, I'm all ears. He said, there is a company in Boston called Software Arts, mm -hmm. which was, which developed physical right. for the Apple 6502, the first Apple one or Apple two. And, uh, so with Rocky, like I made a contract with them that we get their software and their documentation and their code. We pay them $25 from every unit sale that we sell. We just sell it for 300 bucks. <laughs> so we made a lot of money. So I went with one of my uh, section managers to Boston. We spent a week there. We met with these two guys. I just saw their name. And Bricklin and Frankston. Franklin, yeah. And they walked me through the code. I had a lot of questions. I did not know the HP assembler for the HP 85, so I became the cross, a man, a human cross assembler between the 6502 and the HP assembler <laughs> for the HP 85. <laughs> and I brought a copy of that work for me here. Oh, that's fascinating. I saved that for years to come. It must have been quite an effort to do. And this was porting VisiCalc to the Hewlett Packard HP. system. Yeah. Amazing. And how long did that take you? That must have been quite... Nine months. <laughs> I can and see why you saved it. <laughs> for a whole year. Not a single one. For a whole year. So I was a programmer, developer at the time. And I used to build a system that will assemble this because I had too many levels. You see this? Yes. Levels. I used to build a system that I used to compile this because they only allowed so many levels. <laughs> and I had this is the most code that Anybody did on the HP 85. Wow. So it was really pushing the system to its pushing limit. Pushing the system and pushing the tools. We had we the had hardware emulator in, in the lab, and I would go there and, you know, emulate and assemble this, and then you can see the results. So, wow. But this is Thank safe. you for bringing that in. Save. Don't use. <laughs> Can I choose the favor? <laughs> yes. Um, wow. Um, well, for, for so for for how long were you there then doing that? So I work? stayed in the Corvallis until 1970, from 79 until 19, the end of 83. Okay. Okay. So in the meantime, I worked on. We designed in the lab an 80, the 85 was only 32 columns. So you have to make a score right, make a score left, 
go up, go down, but the width of the column is only seven characters. <laughs> but you can make it bigger. Mm -hmm. It was not limited to seven, but you could see seven columns on a five-inch screen. I see. So they designed the HP 87, which was 80 columns. So I ported that to the 87. It was very easy to do. And we had a guy in marketing who took the data that we generated on a spreadsheet and he did the graphs with it. So we had another piece, that's why we called it, when we sold it, we called it Physical Plus. Okay. <laughs> that was my name. Of course, many companies use Plus these days. Right. So, and uh, so I became interested in localization when we were trying to make the HP 85, the HP 87, and future computers that we were working on to make them work in European languages to support French, German, Italian. So we had three translators come from Europe and I was working with them. And we would, the HP 85 was a seven bit code machine, it was not eight bit. So we had to go through the character set and modify some of the characters. Escape sequence is one of them. So do you enter escape? You enter two escapes, then it will say escape. Huh. So we used some of the characters in the zero and one column to enter E with an accent, German, you know, right. French, German, Italian, whatever. So we made the seven bit machine work for European languages. And it was an instrument. It was <laughs> not called a PC. Right. Okay? Because they used it for instrumentation to connect it to other machines that will collect the data, it will show it on the screen, they analyze it, you know. This was anyway, so in nineteen I think 82 or 83, when this was finished, I was assigned to be a project manager for a new machine that was called Pisces at the time. Was that the kind of working name for it? It was a working yeah. name. Yeah. It was like a sewing machine. <laughs> yeah. It was based on Unix. Hmm. And we generated a project for it called Personal Information Instrument, Pi. Hmm. And the manager loved it. So we called it Pi, and we started to work on it. When one of the VPs of HP came to Oregon, they used to come every so often. Right. Including Bill and David Packard, the unit. And he said, you're not supposed to work on this. This machine, is Unix, belongs to Colorado. So they canceled the project, they killed it, they shipped the code to Colorado, and we never heard on it about it ever since then. In the meantime, I became interested in localization. So I became acquainted with some sales people that came from Geneva, Switzerland, and Athens, the HP offices, and they were trying to sell a printer for HP in Abu Dhabi, I think, or someplace there. And the HP printer didn't have any Arabic characters. <laughs> so they asked me to design an Arabic character for it. Well, of course, the first thing we had to do was to do a context analysis algorithm. I'm going to show you what that means here on the screen. Oh, great. Because the Arabic characters connect. Right. And so, the, well, well, please, yeah. when it, for, um, could you I explain more about that? Yeah, so the, we had to design a font that sits on the printer that sat in the memory where the characters are 
which are Latin and Arabic. But the Arabic characters would connect on the printer, but the, the Latin ones will not connect. Right. So they became interested. They said, you know, we would like to make SVPCs work in Arabic. We have some support engineers. We have money. We have funds. We will transfer you to Switzerland with your family. They can go to school there, which they did. International School in Geneva. And I became NFSC, it was called NFSC, Foreign Service Employee. And so we went in December of 1983. Could I ask you, uh, no. just to, if we pause there in 1983, you know, when you were working, in I Kovales. guess a decade earlier, when you were working... In Kovales. Well, no, when you were working in, um, in uh, Jordan, oh. um, you know, Service. maybe in the 70s. Yeah, in, uh, in 76. In 76. Yeah. So, you know, a little, you know, less than a decade earlier. Yeah. And... Um, the, the people you were working with were kind of going from not having electronic computers to adopting mini computers. If we fast forward now to 1983, yeah. what was, how would you characterize the computing scene in the Middle East at that time? Were there other companies already um, succeeding with producing personal computers that could support Not, Arabic? No, or? none. Nothing. Nothing. The IBM PC was introduced in 1984. <laughs> okay, so yeah. it was wide open. Wide open. All right. Now, let me backtrack to the early 60s. Yeah. Which is when I became a software programmer. Okay. Please. I worked for a company called Aramco. Oh, sure. An American oil company. Now it's called Saudi Aramco. And I worked in the AEM in the AEM department, electronic accounting machines. I was the top clerk. That's how they hired me. So they give me these instructions: sort, collate, tabulate. I'll print and type, type them on a typewriter, and I became fascinated. I said. Can I learn some of this stuff? My manager at the time, they were all Americans. Huh. Including the key punch people that really? were there were, yeah. They would pay the key punch person, the American key punch person, $600 a month. They would pay, pay the guy that was hired from Lebanon or Jordan or other parts of the Middle East. They pay him 600 reals, which is four and a half times less than the American. The programmer would be paid in dollars. He would have a cost of living allowance. He goes to the bank in New York, because that's where they came from, deposited. They live over the cost of living that Aramco gave them. They had their own quarters. I could not live there. I didn't have a degree, that's what I was told, and I was not an American. Hmm. That's what pushed me to come to the U.S. Interesting. Now, in the, it was all an IBM shop. Yeah. So. Where was this? Around uh, Dharan, Dharan in the Eastern Province. Okay. Not Tehran. Dharan. Right. D H. So, thank you. D H A R C R N. So, the. So I became a programmer before I officially became a programmer. <laughs> it took my manager two years to create a position for me in the non-American payroll. Hmm. That's what it had to do. And I used to write software applications, RPG, autocoder, SPS for the 1401, 
And one of the projects that they gave me, that's why I want to mention this to you, is we, they wanted, the Saudi government wanted the paychecks to be printed, the value of the amount of the paycheck for the non-American payroll to be printed in Western Arabic numerals, hmm. Hindi shapes. I can show you these in here. That would be great. These are, you know, one, two, three. Yeah. We call them Arabic numbers, <laughs> but they are Hindi shapes. Oh. oh. And they do not connect. <laughs> right. So my manager asked me to write a piece of software and modify the IBM 1403 printer, which you have a copy of here. Right. To, which is was a chain printer. Yep. To take some of the characters out which is what I did later on in Corvallis, Oregon, to change the character set 7-bit to make it work for French, German, Italian, etc. Right. So we had to take some characters off from this chain printer to print these 10 numbers in Hindi shape on the Arabic paycheck. I see. So it that was my first localization project. Right at the very beginning. I didn't even know it was localization yeah. at the time. <laughs> and then you came to, and then that inspired you to come to the United States to... To go to school. And... And I went to school in Detroit, Michigan. I went to West States. Right. I came from the hot weather in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> in January cold. of 64. <laughs> yeah. And right snow, into it. To Detroit, Michigan. Mm. To make a long story short, I, went, I had three and a half years of experience. Nobody can touch me. Right. I was a programmer 100% for the 1401, for the 360. I went to the computer center at Wayne State. I said, I would like to see if I can find a job here. Well, I knew what the rules were as far as immigration is concerned. If you work on campus, you can work 20 hours a week. So the guy said, but we can't pay you as much as you're worth. I said, I don't care how much you pay me, I'm going to keep my experience. Mm. The minimum wage at the time was $1.25. They paid me, paid me a dollar an hour. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> so I was coding. And we're now in the mid-60s. This is... 65-ish? No. No. I came, yeah, in the mid-60s. Okay. I came in 1964. Okay. Yeah. So I was doing software. And my responsibility was application software for the student system, registration system. Right. Easy. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, they were hiring people off the street who didn't have a degree, and these guys tell me, you're going to take this tray, 2,000 cards? And go assemble it on the 1401? I said, yeah, what's the matter? I said, I never wrote a program this week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I stayed with, with the university until I graduated in 68. Okay. And I interviewed with IBM in upstate New York, not for Gipsy, but in, uh, near Binghamton. What's the name of that center in Binghamton, New York? I don't know, I'm sorry. Yeah, they had 360s there, they interviewed me. I had five offers from IBM to go work for them. But they were not getting me, me a green card. They were, this, at the, in those days, they were not... They would not like help you get one or no, whatever? No, they, they just would not do it. So six months later, they put it out, the offer. I was 
my offer was a thousand dollars a month. Engineers at the time, my my colleagues who graduated were making seven hundred and fifty a month as industrial engineers. Mm-hmm. I was a programmer. I had experience. So I came to the West Coast on vacation to see a friend of mine. He said, why don't you interview here? And I went to HP and he said, no, we don't have anything for you. <laughs> he said, go to Stanford. I said, Stanford is on the East Coast. Stanford's right here. <laughs> he said, he was living in Palo Alto. So I went to Stanford. They had a project fit for my shoes. Exactly. They had a funding, funded program by the Ford Foundation to create a database management system to put the student tracker system, the alumni system, and pair personnel on HP computers on the 360. Very much like the work that you had just been doing as an undergraduate. As an undergraduate. <laughs> so my project was the student information system. Okay. I did that, finished in 72. I did not get the promotion that I deserved from Stanford. So I looked around. I was in the newspaper. HP is hiring for the HP 3000 to do the same thing I was doing. <laughs> I did at Stanford. So well, was, was Stanford more helpful in terms of the, uh, oh, yeah. the residency stuff? Yeah, I got my green card within six months. <laughs> they took care of it. Oh. Yeah, we do this all the time. Oh, sure. For faculty, yeah. I suppose, yeah. they have so much I, more of a I system. I asked the immigration office to transfer my papers from Detroit to San Francisco. They did. Within three months, six months, I had. Perfect. I had the green card. So. Well, I, I, I distracted you from, from 1983 and moving yeah. to Geneva and, yeah. and, and that. Uh, the kind of the, the Middle East is a wide open yeah. market yeah. for for personal compu- localized personal computer. Yeah. In MEA, the Middle East Africa region, HP is committed. We're not just involved. <laughs> I use this over and over and over again. When I visit the offices, the salespeople, we are committed to building this to make it work in Arabic. Hebrew, Greek, Turkish, Eastern European, Cyrillic. Wow, all of those all were of in these that language. package. Okay, because wow. Greek and Turkish and Portuguese are Latin. We didn't have to change the chip. Cyrillic is Latin, excuse me, like Latin. Right. We didn't have to change the chip. Okay? And so when they gave me these system engineers. I said, this is nothing else. I also worked on the Euro <laughs> to make sure it works on SU computers. This is the article that I wrote about the ISO standard and Unicode. I just became one. Oh, great! So you, when you when you get to when you get to Geneva and you have this uh, commitment, you know, mm-hmm. on the part of the company to to do this, um, uh, and forgive my ignorance, sure. um, what was the status in 1983 of these kind of um, standards for encoding? and representing non-Western uh, text. Well, there was an ASCII Arabic standard that was designed by somebody in Morocco. OK. OK. So we used it as a basis. And in 1976, HP, when I was not here, HP sold several HP 3000s, which had this Arabic code, seven bits, 
Was it because that was all that was really available, or...? It was all that was available. Yeah. So the coding system, I started to work with the coding community, which is ECMA, European Computer Manufacturers Association, based in Geneva. I used to attend their meetings. We designed an Arabic aid system. Mm-hmm. Based on the characters that were designed in 7-bit, because the Arabic alphabet is 29 letters only. 29 letters. It is the shapes that needs to be entered into the hardware, into the printers. That you cannot, you cannot have an EEPROM that can put the characters not connected. Mm-hmm. So we, we had an EEPROM programmer that we used to, excuse me. Oh, please. <coughs> in the office that we used to print the EEPROMs. And when they send us a circuit board for a printer, we plug it in there and we can see that because it's connecting. Hmm. So this is really about, it wasn't difficult to make a, an encoding to represent the, the 29 letters of Arabic, but it was, the problem was in the character generation to the put screen. on the screen yeah. or in the printer yeah. s- such that uh, the text would all be connected when yeah. it output. Yeah. Okay. No, so not all the text. There's an algorithm which we, 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 we had. For, for somebody, making these connections. Yeah, from somebody in HP Grenoble. <laughs> it is a terminal. I said, hey, Mike, you can have this. So we took it. But to tell you about this machine. Yes. This machine had a PC board based on a terminal, based on with DOS sitting on top of it. Okay. And it was designed here in Sunnyvale, by the way. It was not done in Oregon. We don't <laughs> do junk like this in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> You can't cut this one off. No, we're going to leave that in, <laughs> unless you really insist. Um, so so we're, we're now we're talking about just the the, mo- the monitor, the terminal. The terminal, but yeah. I, need, I need the code. Right. So I used to come to the office here in Sunnyvale, meet with the manager. He says, Mike, how many of these are you going to sell over there? I said, I'm not the salesman. I'm the engineer. <laughs> you know, I'll make it work. And we sell as many as we can. Because if we don't have it, we cannot sell right. other HP computers, other printers, other systems. You know, it was, uh, we were not talking about HP Unix, and HP Unix came later on. So I said, can you give me the source code of this terminal? I promised, as an R&D engineer, in my blood, I will not give it to the salespeople. This is what they were worried about. Give it to the salespeople, they will distribute it across the Middle East without anything working, and then they fall in my lap. Hmm. I said, I promise. So I built trust with this division, with this GM, he was the GM, with R&D engineers, with my engineers that I had, two of them, one in Israel and one in Geneva. I had one from Algeria to work on HP 250 system, which was a basic machine that was designed in Colorado, but 
they wanted to sell it in Germany. They sold it in Germany, HP basic system, and they wanted to work in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I hired this engineer from Algeria to come to Geneva, send him to Boblingen, okay. where HP and Stuttgart IBM is. So my mode of operation became, I have to go to every R&D manager in the U.S. where we have PCs, printers, terminals, operating systems, MPE, spoolers, editors, to make sure that we can convert those to use the new character set which we are designing for this system. So the character set would really drive hardware changes across all of these things? Yeah, they will have the same character set in all of these systems. Got it. In those days, it was not a proportional spacing, but later on, it became proportional spacing because some of the work that I did with the printer division in Boise, there is a printer, of course, they used to have cartridges. I didn't bring one. I think I have one at home. And each cartridge will have a different font. Character set. Oh, interesting. Font. interesting. They are not okay. character set. Oh, just fonts. They are the fonts. <laughs> but the context analysis algorithm will see a character coming down the line. It will change to the shape that is supposed to be on the screen, on the printer, on MPE, whatever. So it was a really big, big project of coordination across the company to, I used to, to come push here this. every six to eight weeks. From Geneva? From Geneva. Then fly back. I have a side trip to go back to the Middle East and tell the people what I did, where we are, give them a promise report. You know, we created a cookbook, MEA cookbook for the engineers in the U.S. that don't know what to do, what it means to go right to left. Right. Whether it's for Arabic or it's for Hebrew. So we created an Arabic cookbook called the MEA cookbook, a Hebrew cookbook, uh, serbo Croatian cookbook for Eastern Europe. It was called Yugoslavia at the time, of course, uh, for Cyrillic. And these became the basis of the cookbook when I came back in 1988. After we finished this and we put them in the field and people were using them, I created the HP Globalization Cookbook here at HP Corporate in Palo Alto. Hmm. I have a copy of that here. Now it took, you know, what's, uh, what's interesting uh, listening, um, listening to you talk about it is that um, you know, it's taking you five, five years to do this project, which I with, could with see, many engineers in the U.S. Which I could see why it would take that long, but isn't it also? No, it took only. We introduced this in 1985. Oh, took, so it took two years. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So. But we didn't have okay. everything else working. Okay, just get it out. Yeah. Just get it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show it. Yeah. And, and these are photographs of the introduction. Yeah. And where did you do the introduction? In Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia. It was one of the biggest customers. And were you were you in the main for for the market for the Arabic language systems? Were you mainly selling to governments or were you selling to companies? Mostly governments. Mostly governments. They were government contracts. Okay. Yeah. And were they um, was there any kind of arrangement where the governments who were interested in having the systems, oh, did yeah. they help pay for the development, sort of advanced orders or? Well, they were not put advanced orders. They want to see the system working. Yeah. Okay? They want to see Arabic characters on the screen. I used to go to offices of ministers in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere 
And <coughs> when your turn comes, you have to drink your coffee. That's number one. <laughs> Which I drink. Sometimes they they make you drink tea in the hotels anyway, uh, with cardamom in it. Mm. We put we put coffee in our Arabic coffee, but the coffee that we drink here in Cupertino, you know, it's called Turkish, but it's actually Arabic. <laughs> the sediments are at the bottom. Yes. We don't drink those. <laughs> anyway. So you would sit there and explain to the minister, you know, what you plan to do. You have printers, you have terminals, you have PCs, you have HP 3000s, you have basic machines, you know. They would listen to you and then you leave. Hmm. It's not the salesman to sell. <laughs> that was not my task. Right. Um, well, one more uh, just question about context, and then perhaps we could see a little bit of, uh, of the performance of the system. Yeah. But um, was there... Funding? Well, I'm just wondering about the regional variation in the Middle East. You know, were there, were there particular governments or, or countries at this time of the mid-1980s that were more interested in having this? Where, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Where, oh, yeah. Could you describe that a little bit about where were the most interested? Where did it seem to be? Believed? North Africa, Algeria at the time. It was not the kind of government they have right now. I went to Algeria many times. And we meet with the military. They are the people that buy the equipment. Yeah. Saudi Arabia. Morocco, Morocco, Tunisia, you know, where mm -hmm. the thing started in 10, 15 years ago. They were big buyers. What about Egypt? Egypt was not a big buyer. Hmm. They had money. Hmm. We had an office there, <laughs> you know. They buy, but they were not the big buyers. Mm. The buyers were the Gulf countries and North Africa. Okay. And of course, Israel for Hebrew, Greece for Greek, Tur Turkish for Turkey, right, and Serbo Croatia for Yugoslavia at the time. And I guess Iran by this time Iran is, you was can't, not in the picture. You can't export to them, right? We were not doing Persian. We were oh, doing Arabic. Arabic. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. We can edit that out instead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we were not doing Thank Arabic. You. Okay. Uh, but you Persian. couldn't have done it anyway if you wanted to as no, HP, you couldn't. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's 79, the revolution. Yeah. Okay. And you could not even sell there. Right. Well, perhaps you could show us um, a little bit about just uh, the system. and. This was, was this system one of the? Prototypes. This is one of the prototypes. So yeah. this we're seeing what would have been available around 1985. Yeah, yeah. Great. And it, it was fascinating to me that um, it had this touch screen interface at that it time. Did. It's the very simple matrix. Yeah, and these are kind of uh, photoelectric diodes or yeah. something around the? Yeah. yeah, it was a first HP touch screen, but now it is different. Yeah. So. So the underlying operating system is DOS. Is DOS. Riding on a terminal terminal code. Okay. So I have to take that code, modify it, take the circuit board. I opened this thing so many times, <laughs> my my knuckles were hurting. Because every time they, uh, we had to design the chip in Grenoble, France, which, because this is where it was designed. Yeah. And they were extreme supporters of designing a chip that has Arabic in it. Mm. So we designed one for Arabic, one for Hebrew. I'm not sure we did one for Greek and Turkish. And these are all EPROMs holding these character sets? No. This is 
an electronic device that is masked. Oh, so these it's were first EEPROM and then make it as no, just a prom. No, EEPROM was for printers. Oh. For this thing, it was It's a just mask. a ROM. It was a, a, a ROM. Okay. okay. You could not modify the ROM. Once you had it, you had it. Once yeah. you had it, you had it. Okay. If they make a mistake, they burn all the set of ROMs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. And could the and could the computer be configured just to the unlike the prototype with the production model would it just kind of boot up in yeah. in the Arabic character Arabic. set yeah okay yeah but, but I forgot how to do that okay so I can so I can type I forgot how to change the uh, size of the uh, print screen yeah the, the font. But uh, say in English, so what I'm inserting text, but the text you read right to left. I could not figure out how to enter the text from right to left, so I'm inserting it. Show you the five shapes. This is the initial. If I enter one more next to it, it will connect. This is final. If I enter one more, it will be medial. You see the medial? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to enter several medials. That's how it connects. So it and is. This is a chip. A ROM chip. Okay. Designed by HP inside HP in Grenoble, France. So I, just so we get it for the recording, and so uh, and forgive me if this is sure. so simple-minded, but it seems to me like what I was seeing is, you know, you're entering the first character, um, and kind of the final the final form of the script is going to be determined by the sequence of characters, right? No, so they the, can interconnect. By the inter uh, context analysis algorithm. Right. Which in any code they call by die. Okay. So depending on the sequence of of keystrokes, um, uh, obviously the the script will appear differently. Yeah, to, but the yeah. way the algorithm works, yeah, you scan two letters before and two letters after okay. the character that you enter, and that determines that the context, determines the size of the text you're going to modify to make the shape correct. Thank you. Okay. Here's the numbers. Zero. Zero is like a period. So I hadn't realized that that in, I mean, this is just, again, showing my ignorance, that in, um, that these Hindi characters for, for numerals were used in, um, in Arabic instead of the so-called Arabic numerals. It was imported from India. We call them Hindu. Yeah. In our documentation. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we, we, we don't call them Arabic. Right. Because the word Arabic means you type one, two, three. Right, right. You don't type. Right. What has the internet? Can see. Old age. So if you were to enter, say here, numbers, 
I will do them correctly. Oh, it's uh, overwriting. So if I enter a number that's fourth, third letter will become a different shape. Mm. Or it replaces, it should insert it. Insert character. I did insert mine. The second letter mm -hmm. will change shape. Mm. See that? Yeah, yeah. That is a, a final shape of that letter because it's not connected to this one. I see, I see. That's the algorithm. That's the algorithm at play. And so that was, and that that it was that algorithm implemented also in a ROM chip. Yeah. Okay. Was it on the same ROM as the character set? On the same chip ROM. Yeah. No, the the ROM chip has these various shapes. Yes. Of the characters. Right. So if you look at the characters here. Right. These are the character codes. These are the character shapes. There's a difference. Yeah, okay. This is the ECMA 8-bit standard. This is not an ECMA standard. But it is, it is a much uh, higher fidelity representation of written of Arabic. Yeah. Now, to jump a little bit ahead. Please. When I left Geneva, they were selling this system. I have numbers on how much they sold and how much money they made. One thing is funding. The sales office used to take 3% of what they sell, and that was my budget. <laughs> okay, how did I use it? Pay engineers, the engineers, if I come to a division, say here in Cupertino or Palo Alto, right. we don't have money. I'll pay your engineer. I'll pay that engineer. But I'll be on top of them every six to eight weeks. <laughs> I'll be here checking to see how much they did. I had my day timer. I would write notes in it. The R&D manager would be sitting there. He would let them because Mike is taking notes about what you promised to do. <laughs> Three months from now, when he comes again, he's going to double check to see if you did this. But they had trust in me. Yeah. That was the most important thing that I had as an engineer. They had trust. I will not release a code to the field. I will work on this. We will sell systems. We will sell HP mail. We will sell. Uh, I hired an engineer to come from the UK to be stayed with me in Geneva for about a year mm -hmm. to modify HP desk to make it work in Arabic and in Hebrew. Hmm. Electronic mail. And when was that? It was in 1984. Wow, that's very... In yeah. the same context that you're developing this? The same context analysis. Oh my gosh. You said that means I have to keep this buffer for 80 characters all the way someplace and then I have to flip it at the end? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> he was an Englishman. He didn't know a word of Arabic. I had another engineer from Denmark. 
when I when I first came. He came to Geneva for an interview. He said, well, he knows HP 3000 very well. He still works for HP in Roseville. I heard him. I said, here's your cookbook. Berlitz, Arabic. <laughs> Berlitz. Yeah. Learn what this says here. Look at the shapes. Look at the characters. That's what he took with him when he came to the U.S. He became an immigrant, he became a citizen, he got married, he stayed here. Would, did you feel that this project was a success? Oh yeah. With the money they made? It was a commercial success it was in a addition. Commercial I mean, it's a, a technical success. Technical success, yeah. but it was a commercial success yeah. as well. And what would you say was, um, you know, was this a really kind of an opening up for the use of personal computers in this region? Yeah. This this Hewlett Packard project. Yeah. This, wow. This came out before the IBM PC. And when was it that when did did IBM start to pursue this kind of localization and this kind of capability? Before, but they left it to the field. So you had umpteen third parties designing their own Arabic system using an 8-bit character set and they put those shapes like they did for Iraq many years ago and some of those shapes in columns 0 and 1. But they could not fit 228, which is how many I had in the farms and in the Mm. in the, in the uh, uh, system here. Right. They did not. That's where the idea of having a global, universal character set came to my mind. I was working for ECMA on 8-bit characters. There was a project in ISO called ISO 10646. The 10 stands for big, 646 stands for the uh, U.S. ASCII character set. So they allowed them to use the number 10646 as an ISO standard. So I became interested in this in 1988 when I came back to the U.S. I knew the editor of that's 10646, it's Japanese. He used to work for digital. And he asked me if I want to be the chair of this committee. I said, his name is Masami, Masami, Hazigawa-san. Masami, you know more about this than I do. I said, Mike, but you have a different mind than I do. I'm Japanese. These guys don't listen to Japanese. These guys would listen to somebody who knows the language, who knows what this is based on. And so I became the chair of the committee in 1990 or 91. I talk about this. In, this article. in the article. Yeah. To so read in I, detail. I wrote this article. This article was published in June 1993. Correct. So it has the history of 10646, the history of Unicode, the way I know it, some of the some Unicode, they wrote their own stories, which differed than mine, but the end result was we, my objective was to make sure that every computer in the world, HP or non-HP should work in any Arabic, in any sex, in any character that is built on that standard. Right. So he recorded one of their objections at the time. Oh, we can only support 16K, 16,000 characters. 
I said, what's up with China? They have, you know, I'm seeing thousand characters. Right. They want. So I finally convinced Unicode and the ISO committee, which I chaired. I used to attend all of the Unicode meetings. I was not a member. I was working for HP. I was not a member. I said, I'll become a member. HP will become a member once we have one universal character set. You can call it Unicode, but in the ISO standard, it is universal coded character set called ISO 10646. And that's the ISO standard. If you search for ISO standard 10646 in the ISO journal and other journals that they publish until today, I became very good friends with these guys. The editor reviewed this that edited my article at least ten times. <laughs> at least ten. And how about this? How about this? How about that? And my second editor was British. He worked for ICL. Mm -hmm. And he worked for ICL in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. So he knew about the environment. He knew about the language. He knew about the requirement. He knew about the uh, if you will, the, I don't want to use the word globalization because it means many things to yeah. many people. Yeah. The main thing we wanted to do at HP was make the product localizable and then you can localize it for the local language or you can show labels and menus right. or manuals, menus. So the main objective was to make HP products localizable, including MPE, and later on HP Unix. HP Unix did not come aboard until I think just before I left HP in 2000. Was it the case that, um, so we were talking about, you know, the IBM PC comes on and then all these IBM PC compatible machines come on and it sounds like with that it becomes a little bit of a um, a wild or heterogeneous scene where everybody has their own 8-bit yes. Arabic and no. um, In the th meantime, there's no consistency none so was that was it almost you know you have the this goal for IBM was to sell PCs yeah they don't care which software you use. Right. They don't care. At the same time, we came up with HP Vectra. <laughs> so the objective was to make it work like the MPC. <laughs> so I had an engineer in Geneva, a contractor engineer. I said, I want you to write an external reference spec based on the IBM PC to make it emulate the IBM PC. Mm. I had a guy from HP, corporate office, came to check on our code. He said, show me the process that, that you went through. I knew what I was doing. I had a different engineer write the specs for what the IBM does, and I had somebody else code it. Mm. Two different people. And we sold many vectors <laughs> using that same system. Hmm. Was the idea then that you needed these standards for you need these standards for character sets, both the ISO standard and then also this Unicode standard, so that the point there would be interoperability? Interoperability and Make sure that if they apply the BIDI algorithm in Unicode or the context analysis that we have in HP, that we had in HP, we never copyrighted the, uh, the context analysis of HP. There were no copyrights at the time. For software, yeah. It came later on that you can cover. Physically, it was not copyrighted. Right. Yeah. 
to make sure that HP, Microsoft, Apple, IBM, I know many of these guys until today where they work. Google later on, the, 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 the head of Unicode, the co-founder of Unicode went from IBM, from Apple to IBM when they established uh, a Troika company in Cupertino, IBM, Apple, and I think HP. Oh, yeah. It didn't work, and anyway, he just changed phone numbers. <laughs> anyway, he, he was the co-founder of Unicode. So I, I met with the, these two co-founders before Unicode was on the written anywhere. But their idea, they showed me what they were doing. Because they had trust. They knew HP can do this. There was no doubt in their mind. We were ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Apple did not have an Arabic Apple yet. The first Arabic Apple was the Macintosh. Ah. Based on small talk, mm -hmm. which we had a copy of at HP. <laughs> yeah, Xerox gave small talk to all these companies and Apple took advantage of it, and we did too. The Pi concept that I yeah. initiated at HP that got canceled from because it was using was Unix. Well, there's no small talk, <laughs> but it was designed for a Unix machine, three and a half inch disk hmm. that you can load it from a three and a half inch. Oh, disk. load the small talk system from the yeah. disk. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It's a shame that it never got out. Never got out. I, I recently donated the machine to some company that takes it recycle it. I, there's no use for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I even have seven bit systems for the first HP portable called the Nomad domain. Mm. And we made it work in Arabic and Hebrew, but we didn't sell it to it. It was the 80 inch screen. Seven, seven line oh, right. with, I don't know if they have a copy of it here. I'm not sure. I, I offered many years ago to donate all of the equipment I have that I don't need, I don't use, to the museum. If they want it, they can have it. Well, that, Just like this one. I'll have a conversation after this with, with my yeah, colleagues. I, I, have, I have calculators that don't work in Arabic, <laughs> but HP 75, HP 70, they are basic interpreters. Hmm. Oh, right. That I worked on at HP in Corvallis. I was part of the calculator team, which became the PC team. <laughs> so. Well, I did. I did want to ask you if you could, if you could, um, kind of like uh, pulling back the perspective again for having these the ISO and Unicode standards. If you could. Could you just basically describe, like, without them, what the situation would be? We would have two different standards. And this is, was not on my mind. It was not on Unicode's mind. We would have two standards. Unicode would still be 16-bit characters. And now we can Unicode and 10646. We synchronized ever since then. They are synchronized. The editor that worked for me for many years is French. He's worked for Microsoft. <coughs> he took my place as the chair. The last meeting I chaired was in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. 25 years. <laughs> I chaired that company. 25 years you did 25 that? 25 wow. years. But I. I but he, he took. He continues to synchronize. We continue to add more characters. Where did the images come from? <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it is not in 646. It was a Unicode, and to make them synchronized, we put them in 10646. You had to adopt the emojis. Of course. <laughs> it's kind of a shame. <laughs> I well, get because ISO does not care about these things. Yeah. ISO is a business office to promote selling standards. Right. We used to sell the standard 
1993 standard, on which this article is based, 500 Swiss francs, hard copy. <laughs> hard copy. I see. <laughs> well, I, what I wanted to try and get at yeah. was just what, what would happen if there weren't a character standard at all? What would that, I mean, I'm, what I guess I'm trying to get at is, is to draw you out about the importance of having these standards at all. It is, I don't say interoperability only, because it makes the software, it makes the data move from one place to the other. Thank you. Any company, Microsoft can read Apple data. I can read Apple Arabic on my phone. I don't know if you ever saw that. I haven't. Oh, you haven't? Easy. <laughs> and what you have on the, on the iPhone, yeah, this button here. Ah. This is the keyboard. And this, this just comes keyboard. with the operating system. Huh? And that just comes with the operating system. It comes with the operating yeah. system. This is the whole idea of having a universal character set. And when do you think that the, and when was the first, this first um, ISO 10646 standard uh, kind of set and and propagated. Well, it started in 1993. 1993. So yeah. this is when it started. Yeah. Okay. And they were selling it in hard copy. See this guy says here. These are the same ones that I printed here. <laughs> I see. It's the same. Yeah. The same algorithm. And is it using the same um, context analysis algorithms? Uh, it's called the BIDA algorithm, which is available in the Unicode library. Okay, so yeah. even that contextual... Anybody can use it. The algorithms are standard now, too, for determining yeah, you know, how I mean, to draw the shapes. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they find a bug here, a bug there. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, well, maybe just given the time, I wonder if you could, could you talk a little bit about, you know, as, as things get into, um, you know, the networked world and the World Wide Web, um, did that present new challenges or did that make things it's, easier it's, or it's harder? It's or? It's because the encoding system, this is covered in the Unicode book, the encoding system talks about this. The, what is used on the internet, on the web, is an encoding called UTF-8. UTF-8, yeah. Yeah. Unicode calls it Unicode Transformation Format. In the 10646 book, we call it Universal Transformation <laughs> Format. These are some of the minor differences in terminology. But the editor who took my place, the convener who took my place, he left Microsoft, he's also the editor of both this the and, the, and the ISO standard. They just met in London <laughs> to add more images <laughs> and some minority languages, Cypriot, uh, archaic, language. Mm -hmm. The people want to document what they have in their history. Right. Yeah. I, I had a, a stone from Greece we met uh, which was uh, I forgot what it was called. They made a duplicate of the actual stone. The Rosetta Stone? That's the one. Yeah. They make a copy of it and give it to each one of us in the meeting. <laughs> it's I appropriate. Have one, I have one at home. <laughs> It says this is an authentic copy of the Rosetta Stone. 
And but with but that, we don't have the Rosetta and Unicode yet. <laughs> well, maybe somebody will make an emoji. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so with that uh, UTF-8 for the web. That's their, their encoding model. Essentially what you have is you have an 8-bit character set. Yep. So the first row of the table of Unicode and 10646 is only two columns. The, f the first row is 256 characters minus the control codes, okay? So, I cannot fully describe the UTF-8, but you can read about it. I, I'll leave this with you. You can read about it, and you can Google it on the internet. He, uh, this book is on Unicode.org. Okay. You can see the whole thing. Okay. And they had uh, uh, they had their to it to make it understand that this is a UTF-8. So they encode the fact that it's a UTF-8 followed by the code itself. I see. <laughs> so, so, so if you want to encode a Chinese character, yeah. which is 20 bits long, you would use UTF-8 by, or UTF-16 or UTF-32, all of these are described here, to make sure that the first character is an identifier and the following letters are the code itself on the table, I see. on the standard. I see. So that's how they make it easy to use the internet, to use they port it, Microsoft can read it from the internet, Apple can read it from the internet, IBM can read it from the internet, HP can read it from the internet. And these same sorts of um, contextual algorithms can, yeah, can operate. They, they use the by die, it's called the by die algorithm. Okay. They described can. here. And same so those index. same algorithms are working same on the algorithm. web. This was my whole idea when I first thought about globalization. When I went to, after I came back from Switzerland, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to make sure that we don't, nobody has to suffer going through hard code, changing chips, changing grounds, changing EFRAMs, burning EFRAMs. This is what I want to do. And, and these standards way. get you away from having to do any of that. If you don't have the standard, you have multiple standards. Okay. No interoperability. No communications. If you go it went this way and also went this way, we will have two different standards. Hmm. And my goal was to bring them together. Hmm. And I used to go to all of their meetings. And I used to chair all the ISO meetings. The technical committee meetings, and they knew that, and they would pick my brains. <laughs> How do you do this? How do you? Why? Why do you have to meet so many times? We used to meet four times a year, so you could start to meet four times a year. <laughs> Until today, they meet four times a year. <laughs> they, I don't want to say they copied our procedures, but used the processes that I developed in ISO. Very simple. Well, it's kind so, of. Some people might say, no, we, we created our own. Of course, you created your own. But you wrote that my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mike, just being mindful of the time, I think we need to break here. But thank you so much. It's been it's just uh, absolutely fascinating. And thank you for, for bringing all these materials and, yeah. and talking with us about it. Sure. Yeah.